The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. The backbone of any complex society is its infrastructure. It is in essence the glue that binds communities, provinces, and countries together. The concept of infrastructure was central to Rome's dominance as an empire for 500 years. Cody Gregory writes, one of the key aspects of Roman society and development was its unprecedented utilization of roads, sewers, and aqueducts. Here in British Columbia, it was the railway that brought us into confederation, and it was the development of hydroelectric power that catapulted the province forward economically. Mark Liedemann, the president and CEO of Infrastructure BC says, we're building on those legacy projects to ensure the province has the essential structures needed to thrive. In her letter to the Board of Infrastructure BC, Finance Minister Katrina Conroy says, government and public sector organizations must continue to advance results that people can see and feel in these key areas. Strengthened health care, safer communities, attainable and secure housing, and a clean and fair economy that delivers affordability and prosperity. I invited Mark Liedemann to join me for a conversation that matters about the never-ending work of planning and building the infrastructure the province requires. Mark, welcome. Thank you. A lot of people would be going, infrastructure BC, what is that? How come I don't know what it is? But, but what, what is your mandate? Uh, so we've actually been around since 2002. Some of us may know uh, the organization as Partnerships BC. We were rebranded a few years ago as Infrastructure BC. Same people doing the same thing. Uh, so we actually occupy a really interesting space. I would say we're the space right at the nexus between the private sector and the public sector. So we've got about 55 people working in Infrastructure BC. I'd say other than one person, none of us have come from the public sector. Everyone is a private sector hire, including myself. Hmm. So when we think about infrastructure, government doesn't have any design firms on the payroll. Government doesn't have any construction firms on the payroll. Everything that gets designed and built in the country is done by the private sector. But the problem is the private sector doesn't know how to communicate very well with the public sector, and the public sector doesn't know how to communicate very well with the private sector. So we're kind of this interface in between. So we understand kind of what government is trying to achieve, kind of with its policy objectives and the infrastructure that it needs to do, and then we understand how actually transactions need to get done, what is commercially reasonable, and what can and how that changes over time in the market. And then we help the government plan and procure and then implement kind of large complex infrastructure projects, generally things $100 million and greater. Would these be projects that the government is responsible for financially, or is there a, a variety of different financial models that make it work? So, in our past, we did a lot of kind of public-private partnerships, which had a private uh, sector investment and kind of a long-term return. We call them P3s or public-private partnerships. BC did probably about uh, 40 of those over the time. Many of them are still in operation uh, right now. Uh, that's not kind of our current focus right now. And there's actually been a big kind of decline in the use of P3 models across the country, not just here in mm -hmm. BC. So what's happening now is we have a few projects that still have private financing in them. But now the private financing is paid back when the construction is complete. And we don't tend to have a lot of, um, we actually have no involvement with the private sector um, managing and operating the asset after it's been constructed. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. You said that this is uh, the P3 model has been in decline across the country. Why? What are the complications that are associated with that? So it, it's varied. Some of them are probably uh, political preferences on, on some play cases, but that's not exclusively the case. I would say if we look at it from a national perspective, the biggest area of investment that we have is actually rail infrastructure. Like Ontario is on a tear with doing infrastructure. You know, Calgary and Edmonton have their own transit plans. BC has its own transit plan. And, and Quebec does as well. So there's just a real renaissance going on with regards to rail. So but what happens if we just take Metro Vancouver is, you know, we're going to do the Surrey Langley SkyTrain now. It's kind of just finishing up procurement. We're going to get into construction. It's several billion dollars. I think it's about 16 kilometers. 
So it took us years to kind of cobble up the money to get this multi-billion dollar project ready. So we, everybody has the partners, have the funding. We're going to get this thing built for 16 kilometers. But the reality is Metro Vancouver probably needs 100 kilometers of, of rail network, not, not 16. But once we have these public-private partnerships, no one has been able to find a good way to, to kind of open them up and do an extension and then add on to them. They're very oh, kind yeah. of closed contracts. And right. renegotiating the contract with a single entity is just brutal. Lots of the very smart people have banged their head against the wall and failed to figure out how to do this. So as we need to build lots, it doesn't work because it's not really expandable as a contractual model. So we've been we've been relatively lucky with the Canada line. Oh, okay. Which is one of the ones that I worked on earlier in my career, and we haven't had to extend that yet. Yet, yet, mm -hmm. right? At some point, that concession will be done. It's probably a thirty-year uh, concession in total. Um, but if we had to go and let's say take that to Delta, if we if we needed to or wanted to, it would be hellishly complicated from a financial and logistical point of view of reopening that contract. Because you would have to do a sole source negotiation with the people that, that run it right now. And how do you get good value from somebody that says, oh yeah, you want, you want to renegotiate this contract with only me? Well, I'll give you a price. Well, you won't, you won't like it though, public sector. Uh, so is that why when we take a look at the Canada line and the way that it intersects with uh, SkyTrain down at the waterfront, the yeah. two aren't actually directly connected? No, they're not. Because they're independent systems. Independent companies. Like actually... You know, it's oh, a right. subsidiary of SNC Lavalin that uh, runs runs that um, Canada line, but they are completely separate, so separate union, everything. Like they are unrelated, other than that, you and I can tap in at the Fairgate with the same system as we use on the Canada uh, Expo line or Millennium line. So when we take a look at the new uh, Broadway corridor line, yep, is that SkyTrain? That's SkyTrain, and so it fits under your mandate then. Yep, so that's a project that we planned and procured, and we don't have a lot to do with the implementation of that. There's, we have a sister crown, I would say, which is called Transportation Investment Corp. So they're set up by and controlled by the Ministry of Transportation, and we work very closely with them. But they, once the contract is signed, they actually administer the contract on behalf of the Ministry of Transportation. So they're doing that project. They're also doing the Patello Bridge project. So the, the development of transportation, particularly in Metro Vancouver, Fraser Valley, is really going to uh, fall under your area of responsibility to, to get moving. It, and, it, transit's very complicated <laughs> okay. in the Lower Mainland because technically TransLink is the, is the operator of the trains. Mm -hmm. okay? So TransLink is its kind of own level of government. They're created by the province and they're at the same level as municipality. They have the same rights and powers. They borrow on their own and so forth. But I think the TransLink has a funding model challenge, as do all cities in, in North America are about funding big transportation projects. They don't have the funding sources. Right. So they're very dependent on getting contributions from the federal government and the provincial government to make these projects work. The fact is when we talk about the Broadway line or the Surrey Langley line, the majority funder for these projects is the province. It's not TransLink. TransLink is a minority funder, but they are the operator. Mm -hmm. They operate the system, so they are a partner and they are involved, but they're not, I'd say, in charge of the delivery because they're not, they're not putting out most of the money. So the ability to carry financially the load on major projects like this, provincial governments still have limited budgets, and so we have to have a long-term view. Yes. How do we ensure that we have a long-term view that it remains consistent so that there can be ongoing planning, appropriate planning. Yeah, I think, I think that's actually a big issue for the country, actually, is that we don't have, from my perspective, kind of a, a strategic national infrastructure plan. Like other countries do, like Australia actually has one. And that's kind of one of my thoughts that I think we, we could do a better job at. I think you could conceive of like, say, an industry panel would have to be national, obviously. And then that panel would help prioritize what are the most important projects for the country to deliver, have, have to be all the regions, but let's say over the next 30 years. It would have to be a very long-term plan because we would need then commit to that. And then we'd also need to figure out how to allocate the resources, but not only the money resources, but also the people resources, and also to spread out the projects so that 
the market can deal with from a capacity point of view. There's no point having the money and then you want to do 10 rail projects at the same time. Well, there's not enough capacity in the market to do 10 rail projects at the same time. You'll have to say, okay, Montreal is going to go first and then Toronto and then Calgary and then we're going to go back to Toronto and then Vancouver will get its one. And, but we don't, we, we don't coordinate in that way. So I actually often see at a provincial level, the provinces are effectively competing with each other for limited contractor resources. Right. Because there's nobody in BC that wants to wait for somebody in Alberta and nobody in Alberta wants to wait for somebody in Ontario. It's like they, they cobble up to get their money for these really big projects and then they want to go. They don't yeah. want to wait. So we are at times, I'd say, in competition with our provincial neighbors. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. That's rail transit, rail. but there's also road transit. Do you, are you playing a significant role there because there's a tremendous need to continue to expand the network of roads, not just in the Lower Mainland, but throughout British Columbia? Yes. So we, we MOT, Ministry of Transportation, is a big client. We do lots for, with them. So we did the Patello Bridge, example of kind of our aging infrastructure that needs to be replaced. It's from yes. 1936, I think, when it was first yeah. opened up. Uh, we are in procurement right now for the replacement tunnel for the George Massey Tunnel, we call it the Fraser River Tunnel Project. Um, and then we have other projects that we're working on which are not so much expanding capacity but replacing lost capacity through the atmospheric river that happened in 2021. Coquihalla uh, Highway. So Coquihalla Highway, yeah. which is it's finished now, but mm -hmm. we had to replace a whole bunch of bridges there that were washed out on a permanent basis. Then we also have upgrades through Highway 1, kind of through the Fraser Canyon, which also were impacted. So we have three of those under construction now. And then we also need to, we're turning our attention soon to do Highway 8, which is the part that goes from Merritt to Spence's Bridge on the top. Uh, they had big they washouts. They had severe washouts so, there too. Yes, yeah, severe yeah. washouts there. So we're actively working with the Ministry of Transportation to do that. But then other capacity building ones are, you know, right now in the market, we have procurement for a new interchange at uh, 264th and Highway 1 out in the valley. Which is so a, it's, it's, so a, it's, a, it's, a Gordian knot in some ways, isn't it? That's right. So mm. we're going to redo that, but it's all part of a widening program through the whole Fraser Valley that the Ministry of Transportation is undertaking. And some of them are, I wouldn't say simpler projects, but uh, maybe less complex and Ministry of Transportation will do those on their own. Uh, others are more complicated like the interchange and then we are actually helping Ministry of Transportation on those. So we, we are a Everyone in BC can actually voluntarily choose to use us. We have an interesting model. We are a fee-for-service organization, just like an accounting firm or a law firm. Everybody that we work for, Ministry of Transportation, health authorities, they all need to pay us on an hourly basis for the work that we do, just the way they would with any other advisor. The trick is none of them actually have to use us. If they want to go hire KPMG, they can go hire KPMG and do the work. Oh, so you're... Uh, so I am in business where I have to pay the rent and pay salaries for 55 people. And I need to do business development and have good relations and relationships with clients. And I need to provide good customer service, like me and the whole team. And if we don't, then I have a problem. So what is the special value then that you bring that makes you competitive? Uh, well, it helps that we, I guess we're a, effectively a not-for-profit. Like our profits don't go anywhere. We, yeah. we just need to earn enough money to, to cover salaries. I think, you know, and I came from an organization, I used to work at PricewaterhouseCoopers for many years before I joined here. And what we have is that we actually have a, we have a benefit at Infrastructure BC is that we are kind of, we are the center of expertise. And once you have it, it it's, I guess, easier to keep it in that since we're involved with all the big projects, when the next big project comes along, the owner wants to know, well, how, did, how were you successful on the last project? And then they want to tie into that knowledge and then you get the next job. So, and these are complex. Th th uh, these are all big jobs. Because, you know, part of the mandate is healthcare. And yeah. that has many, many components to it. Yes. Yes. But it, it comes back to that. Oh, we're also, you know, we're also in that special place where we come from the private sector. We're owned by the public sector. And we understand how government works and we know how the private sector works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I use my friends at KPMG and PwC and those firms regularly, but they don't have that kind of same relationship with the public sector that we do. And I guess that's kind of one of our competitive advantages. 
So let's say uh, we take a look at a hospital, a uh, new hospital or hospital redevelopment. Yeah. What's the process that gets this started? And at, at what point are, do you become involved? We normally get involved very early on in the process. So we can start with, say, the one that's kind of gone through the whole cycle is the new Surrey Hospital and Cancer Center. Um, and that's recently in construction. Mm -hmm. So we would start with a business, play, business plan for the project. So the business plans are broken up into four parts, A, B, C, and D. It's not that exciting. Uh, a is what's the problem? So not enough beds in Surrey, not enough capacity, so on. Mm -hmm. So we don't tend to write very much of part A because the owner knows what their problems are. Yeah. B is what are the options to deal with the say, shortage of healthcare capacity in Surrey? So we could build one hospital in Surrey. We could maybe build two smaller hospitals in different places. Or you want to add on to the existing Surrey Memorial Hospital. Those are all options how to increase capacity. So once you figure out we're going to build a new hospital in this part of Surrey, that's okay. Now Part C comes in terms of, and this is where really infrastructure BC comes into the, in the focus, in that is how do we engage the private sector? Now that we know we want to build a new hospital in Surrey, who's going to build it? And there's lots of different forms of contracts you can use to build things, mm -hmm. which have different risk relationships for government. So we go and talk to the private sector, um, see what they're interested in, how busy they are, who's going to participate, talk about different types of models. Then we figure out, make a recommendation on the model. And then we do a fair amount of risk analysis for the whole project, including for the procurement. And then ultimately we make a recommendation to government. And then part D is a lot about accounting treatment, how does this get recorded in the government's books, particularly if there's things like private financing involved, um, communications plan, and kind of a go-forward procurement strategy. And governance is an important aspect. How is this project going to be governed? Who's going to make decisions and when? Because it's not always the elected officials. Like They have an important job to do, but they can't make every decision. So what? we really specialize yeah. in these last two pieces. So we do start with the business plan, and if it gets approved, then typically we act as the procurement manager. So Fraser Health Authority was our client there for the new Surrey Hospital and Cancer Center. Uh, so we would manage the procurement process. That takes about 15 months for mm. a big project. And now then we sign a contract. In this case, it's with Ellis Don. And this, this hospital is actually going to take six years to build. So it, it, it's a long process. Business yeah. cases take about 18 months on average. So here you're talking probably about a nine-year cycle from the day people say, I need a new hospital in Surrey to when patients walk, patients walk in, it's probably, this in this case, probably a nine-year cycle. It, it's long. What's the biggest challenge along the way? Uh, because when we hear about our need, our pressing need to develop so many different aspects of infrastructure in the province, what is the one area that you go, I wish we could accelerate that part of the process so that it, instead of it being nine years, it's seven and a half or... There's <laughs> no easy answer. <laughs> no, no easy answer. Okay. And it and it changes over time. Yeah. Because it changes on how what the partly to do with what the construction market um, does. So that that has a big impact on how we can procure and what forms of contract we use. And that's not something that's always stable. So, um, but I always encourage people that want to go faster, not to shortchange the planning process. The planning process is very important. If during this planning process we decide we need an extra OR because we think we're going to have enough demand to do enough hip and knee surgeries in this thing, making that change during the planning stage is cheap. If you decide you need to add an extra OR when your building is already under construction, that is very expensive. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people that want a short shortcut planning to go right to, to construction those are really expensive changes later. It pays to do your homework about what do you need before you start the construction. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. What about the permitting process? Because sometimes you're going to get resistance from people who live in the area. And uh, does that cause uh, complications around the development, especially of any uh, infrastructure project that involves the generation of power? Yes. Permitting is a huge problem, I think, all the way around. Mm -hmm. um, and there's kind of multiple levels of permitting, right? We think about environmental permitting, 
which I think is a major problem in the country, particularly for kind of natural resource type projects, pipelines, energy generation. But then you also have challenges on permitting in just local municipalities, like rezoning, for, if you want to build a building, building permits, development permits. So, you know, one of the interesting examples that I, actually my board chair emailed me a while ago is that they had this fantastic uh, science fiction museum in Chengdu, China, city of 20 million. It's 59,000 square meters. So I think it's three times the size of the Sydney Opera House. And it, it's this fantastic looking building it, made by internationally renowned architects. The project went from conception to opening in 12 months. So, you know, on our side, uh, you know, the city of Vancouver states rezonings, people should expect to take a year. I looked at the Canadian, um, I think, Home Builders Association. The average time to get a building permit in Canada is 20, 20, I want to get the number right. I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to misquote them. Right. Um, it was 14 months. 15, no, I think it's around 15 months. Anyways. So longer than it took them to build to, to a build facility the in China. Yeah, yeah, it takes them so much longer. So we're slow. I do think potentially we need to consider alternatives such as legislation that would streamline approval processes for some public priority infrastructure projects. I'm not saying which ones those should be, but our process is slow and it's also um, unpredictable. Mm. Like I think about the Port of Vancouver and the approval process for them on their Terminal 2 upgrades. Yeah. I don't know how many years that went on. More but than 10. More than 10. Yeah. Very long time. Yeah. Um, and I, it's not that I want to live in a country where we short circuit all our environmental controls and approvals. That It's important to me and to my children that mm -hmm. we have the right place. But I just don't think we can continue on with approvals that take 10 years. So most importantly for people who are watching saying, how come it takes us so long? Uh, I, you know, I want to say I think we want to make sure that we do it right. Uh, and that's part of the price that we have to pay. It's an expensive price if it takes, if it takes 10 years. It, it really is because we need a lot of this infrastructure yesterday or years ago, unfortunately. Are you optimistic that we'll stay ahead of the curve? Well, we're not ahead of the curve right now. No. So <laughs> like, if I was ahead okay, of the curve... Okay, I guess that, not then. <laughs> uh, so no, we're, I think we are spending a lot of money in BC at the, at the provincial level on infrastructure. Yeah. You know, I think the historical spend between like 2010 and 2021 uh, was around somewhere between six and nine billion dollars a year was the spend for the, for the province. Um, and then starting in the provincial budget that was in February last year, 2023, the province has really ramped it up. So mm -hmm. now we're talking $16 billion a year, every year on Is average. Is that enough? No. Okay. No, but, but it's probably more than actually the construction industry can handle, honestly. So, so It's it, what we're going to get. That's what we, I yeah. think that's good that we're trying to spend a lot. Mm -hmm. I think we actually need to spend even more. Yeah. But the problem is then we have capacity problems capacity problems with labor and also you can imagine that would require a lot more permitting and like the cities would need to increase capacity in order to approve all those permits and things that would be associated with that. Like everyone would need to kind of ramp up for that level of activity and, and that hasn't happened yet. It's going to be an interesting time ahead of us, isn't it? it uh, we'll see traffic jams on everything, not just the roads, but on projects and hospitals and on and on and on. We will. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming in, uh, giving us a glimpse into the work that you do that could, can hopefully ensure that we get at least what we need uh, to stay, you know, functioning here in our society and in our economy. Thank, thank you. you.